So let's turn now to the sociocultural tradition. Julian Mirabel, Dr. Julian Mirabel from the University of Arkansas Little Rock, says, what you say has consequences. In other words, our words are strong words. When you say something, it can hit somebody, right? It can really make a difference for better or for worse. And language shapes our relationships, our communities, and our world. It's not just so much about exchanging information or picking a message that helps you reach a goal. And like the sociocultural tradition, I mean, socio-psychological tradition that we just looked at is a little more technical in that way. But the sociocultural area of research around messages really shows us what, how words are like an action. Words, words are powerful. And, and they actually can shape our worlds. So maybe you've heard the phrase, the, the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Of course, everybody growing up knows that's not true and that name calling, for example, even though it's just words, has a really powerful effect. In fact, most bullying is just words, uh, but it can really destroy people uh, if you let it. And so what we say has consequences. That's a, a great quick way to explain the sociocultural approach to messages. It's also interested in uh, the work that words accomplish. In other words, our messages do something in our relationships and in our world. If I tell, for example, my wife that I love her, that's not just information. All right, it does something to the relationship. It binds us just a little bit closer, at least for that moment or for her time. And to show to illustrate that, what happens if you only told your spouse once in your whole life that you loved them and you viewed it as an exchange of information? Hey, I love you. Okay, I told you. Now I don't have to tell you for the next 30 years. Well, for most people, that would not be very satisfying because that work is ongoing. The action of showing love is ongoing. And a lot of times you need to express that over and over again. I know for kids, example, they need to be told and reaffirmed um, that their parents love them over and over again. And how many, you know, what's the balance? How many I love yous need, need to be spoken, need to be heard to compensate for one I hate you? Uh, probably the, the number is, you couldn't even count that high. So words really do accomplish work. And the, word, the phrase accomplish something is not like it's an achievement in terms of winning a, an award. It's just that there is a creative work that happens through words. Our words make agreements. We insult, we compliment, we build, we tear down, etc. Our words create. It's not just some mechanical exchange of information. That's this perspective, the sociocultural perspective. <clears throat> There's a, a theory called speech act theory that captures this really well. In fact, it's probably the most popular theory in this area. And uh, the idea behind it is that meaning is negotiated through our interactions with other people. Meaning is not some objective quantity out there in the world that you tap into or discover. Rather, meaning is worked out in the conversation, in the relationship, through the exchange of messages. So speech act theory has lots of parts. I'm really just going to hit the three highlights. There, is mo there are more in the book, but I think the main three are these. First the illocutionary act. And illocution just means speech. So this is really a uh, speech act. In other words, illocution means this the act of speaking. And so that part, the first concept there is just really the, the words that were said. If you were to type them out on a page and read them off the page, the illocutionary act is the actual speaking event, the utterance that somebody spoke. The illoc and, and by the way, on its own, it may not mean anything, right? Because I have to, as a receiver, I have to understand what that means to make sense of it. So the illocutionary force is the impact or the social force that those words have. And uh, at, to the left, there's a photo of a guy who looks like he's proposing. He has a nice ring and he's asking someone to marry him. There's a force behind those words. When you say, uh, will you marry me? And the other person says, yes, I do. And then they put the ring on the finger. You are engaged. There's a force. You can't just say, just kidding, 
or pretend it never happened. It happened, especially, my goodness, if there are witnesses. So there are rules about what counts as a proposal, for example. So we'll use this proposal as an illustration of constitutive rules, or another way to pronounce that is constitutive. Or in other words, there are rules as what uh, as, as for what constitutes certain kinds of meanings, that word constitute, what are the rules that make something meaningful? So let's just pretend for a minute and we take this normal proposal, between a traditional proposal between a guy and a girl, and let's change the circumstance a little bit and see if it still holds up. So let's pretend that some guys are out, four guys are out and they're at a restaurant bar, and they're hanging out, watching some sports games, probably watching the Bills on a Thursday night football game, and they're having a great time. Uh, one of the guys has a few too many drinks, gets a little bit uh, too comfortable with how he's speaking, and he's been looking at the waitress, who's really pretty all night, and he's been thinking to himself, oh, I wish I had the courage, but he gets the liquid courage to talk to her, and so she comes up, and she hands him, she puts the bill on the table and says, here you go, fellas, and at that moment, your drunk friend says to the waitress, you're the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. Will you please marry me? And she says, oh, absolutely. You're just my type. And then she walks away, leaves the bill and walks away. And their friends are there to witness this. All of the friends there are to witness this at the table. And they just sort of shake their heads. Now, here's the question. Everybody wakes up the next morning in this guy's apartment, right? His friends are all crashing at his place, and they wake up. Does anybody walk up to this guy in his apartment and say, Congratulations, man, you're getting married! Of, of course not, because the rules that constitute what a real proposal is were not followed. For example, there was no ring. Okay, now that doesn't have to be a ring necessarily, but it's one of the things that you would expect from a legitimate proposal. Another thing is that there is no prior relationship. He does not know this waitress at all. He just met her. And so there's no relationship there. People generally don't propose to somebody the first time they meet, I suppose. Again, it could happen, but the general rules about what counts as a proposal usually say there's a prior relationship. Uh, thirdly, he is absolutely out of his mind on alcohol. And so he may not be very aware for what he's saying. And certainly we're always responsible for how we act, but nobody is going to take the person very seriously. That what he says can't really be counted at the same level as when he, you know, if he was sober. And so um, we're, we're not really going to hold him to that. So that proposal doesn't follow the rules of what constitute a real proposal. It doesn't follow the constitutive rules. Now, we don't have these spelled out for every little way of talking, but generally you know it when you feel it. There's something a little bit wrong about what something someone said, or it didn't really fit the circumstance. What you're tapping into there are the rules, of the norms and rules of our society about what people mean when they say something uh, that help you figure out the force or the action that was accomplished. So this one, this proposal fails the constitutive rules for what counts as a proposal, and so the speech act was not really thought of as a genuine proposal. Instead, it's a little bit more of an embarrassing situation. Here's an incomplete list of the kinds of things that we can say that's beyond mere exchange of information. We might assert something. So an assertive is something where the speaker commits to the truth of the statement. So they're they're claiming something to be true. Like I was not there. So you know, the person's assert, asserting that they they were not there. What the truth of that statement is what they're asserting. A directive, you can obviously tell somebody to do something with your words. A commissive where you commit to a future action. Right? You're committing. There is a old episode of a show called The Office where the boss of this branch office named Michael Scott, who's generally not the most competent boss, he uh, tells this local school, this kindergarten class and, and the school administrators and teachers, that uh, when that kindergarten class graduates, he commits to paying for every one of their college educations. Um, 
So that's a big commitment, right? And then in the, in the episode, they do some flashbacks. But in the episode, uh, they name the library after Michael Scott because they're all excited that he's going to pay. And they, all these kids work extra hard to get through school and to really prove that they can do it. And then, of course, it comes time for them to graduate. And they say, okay, you know, we're about to graduate. We want to celebrate this with a ceremony. Come on in. And he doesn't have the money uh, to do this. And so he has to admit this. He doesn't have the money to do it. And instead of paying for their college um, tuition, he ends up giving a couple of them like extra laptop batteries or something, which was just pitiful. And so somebody asked him, why did you say it? You know, why did you commit to this if you didn't have the money? And he said, well, they were in kindergarten. I figured by the time they graduated from college, I would be rich. And I graduate from high school, I would be rich and I could send them on to college. And uh, you got to be careful what you commit to. Expressive is just where you express some kind of psychological state where, you know, if you're grateful, you would thank somebody. If you're remorseful, you apologize, etc. And the declaration is where you literally create something by saying it. So when the United States declared independence, declaration of independence, they created it. They said, we are now separated from England. We declare it. And that's a, you know, a lot of ways that we declare things without being so dramatic. But sometimes you create something um, by saying it, like an agreement, right? You agree, you shake hands, and that there's an agreement. So these are some of the ways, just some small little ways that we show this sociocultural perspective here at work and that our words, our messages, have a social force. They do things in our society. It's not just exchanging data. Another example of sociocultural is the way language gets gendered. And the idea here is that gender, you know, typical male and female ways of looking at things, uh, influence our language. And then that language influences gender expectations. So here's a picture of a physician. And most of the time, if you said the word doctor, someone might picture a male. Even, even, you know, in the 21st century, it still is a stereotype. And if you say nurse, somebody will picture a female. And in fact, if you most most of the time, I know some nurses who are males, but it almost always needs to be clarified. They're a male nurse because these words have such a powerful gender attachment that it shapes the way we look at things. So much so that maybe when we're younger, and I don't think this is much the case anymore, but when we're younger, especially in my generation and my parents' generation, your teachers and the adults in your lives may have guided you through school based upon the way language was gendered. We don't usually see this in, in English as much, <clears throat> but it's there. Uh, policeman, fireman, mailman. The, and if you hear the word man on there, you might not think to do those jobs if you were a female. Now let's think just about mailman for a minute. Uh, I mean, is there anything that requires you to be a man to carry letters and deliver letters? Nothing, right? But throughout uh, the post office history, most of the mail carriers, which is what they call them now, mail carriers were men. And then they changed it to mail carriers. They literally wanted to show that, look, we don't have to be guys to do this job. Uh, we can, women can do this. Clearly women are capable of carrying a letter, even a really thick, a thick envelope. They can do it. We have uh, the faith in them. Uh, so they, and it, it's a lot, you know, some of these other jobs like police officers and, and firefighters, we change the name to remove the limits. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden women are going to gush into those types of occupations and if we change it the other way, that men will then gush into occupations that were typically done by females. But it just shows you the power of language and the limiting aspect that language has on the wit, what we see as our choices. A lot of other languages, like especially the Romantic languages of Spanish, Italian, and so forth, they have gender directly assigned, like a table uh, is either male or female, a box is male or female, a car is male or female, like they, everything's assigned. And so, it, it, and you'll notice, by the way, in a lot of those cultures that the gender roles are even more traditional. And it might be a coincidence, but I don't think so. I think when languages are gendered, it literally keeps people in those expectations, in those norms, in those roles, 
because the way you talk about it is inseparable from the reality of it. So language is gendered, and we tend to see things in terms of two sexes. Generally, we see it male or female, <clears throat> and we are literally trained to see it that way through our language.